beer, it's good for you. Hello and welcome to the video. Here I am sharing my very tried and tested recipe along with a step-by-step -step guide for brewing a bourbon stout. If you would prefer it then this could also be an Irish or Scottish whiskey stout. The process is very similar and will be revealed within this video. So let's get started. Here is a quick preview of this beer's vital statistics as shown on the lower left of the screen. Much more on this later. This recipe, like all of my shared recipes, is written by me and can be found in full within the video's description, which is underneath the video window when viewed on a desktop computer. You'll also find a link to the full recipe on Brewfather which can be used free of charge with some restrictions. Your first steps in brewing this recipe will be to convert the recipe before ordering in your ingredients. I have an easy guide to doing this on Brewfather on my channel, as shown on screen now. Recipe conversion is an essential part of the process for the intended results. After all, my grain and hops are going to be at least a little different to yours, but rest assured that conversion is simple and fast. Do note that this applies to all recipes you will obtain, from others not just mine. The next thing to plan before your brew is your water profile. I recommend the water profile shown on screen which is from Dublin, Ireland, and ideal for stouts and dark owls in general. In terms of a starting pH for your mash, be aware that because this is a darker beer, a higher pH than usual is desirable to smooth off the taste. I recommend aiming in the 5.4 to 5.5 range, but some like to go as high as 5.8 pH. As always, your own experimentation is key for your own taste buds. Within this recipe I'm using oak chips, which may require some preparation ahead of the brew itself, depending on the desired level of flavour. I have had great success in using the range of oak chips offered by Still Spirits, and my instructions relate to this range, which are available in most countries of the world due to their popularity. You can certainly use oak chips that are offered by other companies that are either from barrels that have been used to store bourbon or whiskey, or unused chips that you can soak yourself. Do understand though that it would be very wise to test these the first few times you use them within small batches of beer, so that you can understand how strong the effect is from the oak and the bourbon itself. My timings and amounts are based just on my experience of using Still Spirits oak chips. Let's now look at this process. Here are the oak chips that I am using, these are the Tennessee bourbon chips. These have been repurposed from barrels that have held the spirit for a minimum of 4-8 to eight years as you can see. The directions on the packet relate to spirits, not beer. I suggest using half the packet or 50 grams of these for a 19 litre or 5 US liquid gallon batch. Personally I like to weigh the chips into a jar first that makes pouring them easier than the packet does. I then suggest adding them into a hop sock that has been cleaned and sanitised, and then you can add the sock into a suitably sized glass jar. Be sure to then tie a knot in the top of the hop sock. Next you need your choice of spirits. I have an overall bourbon theme here, but you could go with Scottish or Irish whisky instead if that is your preference. The next step is to fill your jar up to the top with spirit and secure the lid. I personally use 500 millilitres of spirit. This is the equivalent to just under 17 fluid ounces in the US. The selection of this spirit is somewhat limited where I live in Norway, but choose one that is best for your own taste. The soak time on the oak is important. I suggest a minimum of 5 days, but a maximum of 10. Personally, my sweet spot is 7 days. The longer the soak time, the stronger the oak taste will be. Each day I like to give the jar some movement to ensure that all of the chips are being exposed to the spirit, rather than clumping together. After the desired time, the infused spirit is added to the bottom of your keg or bottling bucket, before your final beer is then transferred on top, which will ensure a nice and fast even mix within the beer. It is important that the infused spirit does not contain any stray oak. If it does, then I suggest filtering it out using a coffee filter. You will notice that during this infusion process your spirit will darken. This is to be expected. Onto the brew now and with this particular recipe I suggest holding back the dark grain until the last 10 to 15 minutes of the mash. This will lead to a smoother taste profile that fits very nicely with this recipe. There isn't a huge amount of dark grain in this recipe so you should not run into any real issues with mash thickness. Add in the rest of the malt as per usual ensuring that every grain is wet. When you start the mash, do not be surprised if you find the liquid height is a little high, at least to start with. There are ingredients in this grain build that will cause this. Things will settle down after 10 minutes or so if your grain crush is correct. Let's now take a closer look at the recipe. 
you can see that right at the top here we have an ABV of 7.7 .7 plus. The plus part here depends on the amount of spirit that you're going to add. My recommendations are clear in the recipe, but this is a part that is open to experimentation if you would like more spirit flavour. However, I would suggest that you make your first batch according to my recipe in all areas the first time, as this has been developed and tweaked over time. The BUGU ratio here tells the main story as this is the balance between alcohol and bitterness. Recipes like this can vary from 0.5 to 0.72, so as such this one is not very bitter as we have a BUGU ratio of 0.56. My recipe's tension here is something that sings along with the spirit and it took some trial and error to achieve this, but I believe that I have cracked it, hence why I am sharing the recipe. Naturally the grain bill has also been critical to this, so let's go through it now. At 68% we have parallel malt which provides the bulk of the fermentables for this recipe and provides our canvas for flavour. Then we have oat malt and flaked oats both at 6% which will provide a creamy and velvety texture that are capital to this recipe for the smoothness that this contribution brings to the beer. Along with this is some toasterness and biscuit that will come across in both flavour and aroma. If you cannot obtain both of these then use one of them at 12% and in some cases it will be hard to tell a huge difference, but in my testing there was some difference of benefit. At 5% we have roasted barley which adds in a roasted quality that is central to a stout. At this level it will contribute some coffee-like flavours in the background. This can also bring bitterness, but this will be muted due to the fact that this is being added late in the mash in. I will go through this process shortly. Next we have two types of Carafa Special. These are both dehusked chocolate malts produced by Wyoman. Because they are dehusked they will produce lower levels of bitterness, but in this recipe they are providing different levels of rich flavour of chocolate, coffee and dark fruits, like plum and raisin, along with their respective aromas. If you cannot specifically obtain Wayman malts, then choose two different types of chocolate malt. These can be husked or dehusked in actual fact, as we are introducing these grains late in mash in. At 3% of this grist we have wheat malt which is purely in this mix to add in its own type of creamy texture, but it will also assist with head retention. The Crystal 150 at 2% adds in a little sweetness and body and acts as support for the malty element of this grist. This is further backed up by a small amount of black malt which adds in its own subtle background notes of dark fruit, caramel and chocolate. And finally we have lactose or maltodextrin. Both of these will increase body, mouthful and head retention. Lactose, however, will add in a little extra sweetness too. Usually I just write in lactose to my recipes and feel that this recipe is best with lactose over maltodextrin. But at this level the difference is slight and after testing both versions I am happy with both. This isn't always the case like with my low ABV IPA, but when possible I will list both in the recipe for the brewer to decide on because I am aware that some are lactose intolerant. The most important thing from my perspective is to just present recipes that I feel are the best they can be. I would usually suggest adding lactose or maltodextrin towards the end of the boil, but they can also be added after being boiled in a little water and cooled to your bottling bucket or keg. As already discussed, I suggest adding the dark grains into this recipe late. So stop your pump and remove your top plate if you have one, and then it is best to give the more already present a fair stir. You can then gradually add in the dark malt. Be sure to give it a really good stir, being mindful to stir the entire mash. This will give you a nice efficiency bump, so the time that you spend doing this has no issue in counting towards your one hour mashing time. Once you've actually doughed all of this in, if you want to add the top plate back then fine, but it's not really necessary at this stage of the mash, and those last 10 to 15 minutes of mash in are really there just as a precaution. It is very likely that after all this stirring you would have already got all of the grain's contributions. This is how things looked once all of the dark grain was added and fully stirred in. This is actually video, but when you mash in without the top plate on there isn't much to see anymore, but recirculation is still at work for you within a brewing system like this one. After mashing out and then sparging, I then headed for the boil. As you would expect with a recipe of this type, there was a nice thick head just waiting to be stirred in at boiling point. Some brewers like to remove this because it is easier then to improve on clarity. Clarity within a stout, however, is a non-issue and frankly the protein that you will be removing is important to this recipe, so I will urge you to stir it in. Let's now look at the boil schedule. In keeping with the modern trend, this beer enjoys a 30 minute boil. 
Naturally, it's always nice to save some time, but my core reason for doing this is that less boil-off means more flavour, and within modern malt there is simply no reason to boil for any longer. For more details, see my 10th episode of Brewing Bad on this channel. This recipe uses warrior hops at the start of the boil for bittering. Warrior is used because it offers a lot of bittering and power via its high alpha acid, and that it is very clean. If you cannot obtain warrior, then Columbus, Magnum or Nugget offer reasonable substitutions. Halfway through the boil we have East Kent Golding's hops, which are used to add a little hop flavour and aroma in the form of mild herbs and spice. If you cannot obtain East Kent Goldings, then other types of Goldings or Fuggles will do the job also. Furthermore, I have listed yeast nutrients which will boost your yeast health and provide a nice level of assurance for your fermentation. And then lastly, a quick reminder that the lactose or maltodextrin can be added late during the boil. After the boil, I started cooling down the wort using my counterflow chiller. This starts as a recirculation back into the system while I am waiting for the temperature to come down before exiting the wort into my fermentation vessel. I perform this transfer at around 35 degrees Celsius, which is the equivalent to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature was used because my yeast of choice for this brew is Voskvig. This yeast gives a very pleasing taste result for this recipe and has an added bonus of smoothing out the brew and having it in a prime state usually within one month but sometimes less, which is certainly faster than you would see with regular yeast. You could use a regular yeast for this recipe, but this will also mean a change in attenuation rate, so I would then suggest balancing out the final gravity so that it matches the original. With Voskvig, I recommend a fermentation temperature of 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If you are unable to reach these temps, then ensure that you have at least 25 degrees C or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise you are going to move from an owl profile into a lager one. This effect is not something you experience with most other types of yeast, but it certainly is with Voskvig. At the recommended temperature, I fermented this without pressure, and the fermentation was complete within 24 hours. Lower temperatures will see an extension to this time. I left the temperature at the same level for a few more days just to be sure that attenuation was fully complete before gradually lowering the temperature to my keg temperature. The total time in the fermenter from start to finish was 7 days, but if like me you experience a one day fermentation, you could certainly reduce this time further if it suits you. It is now time for the pour and tasting. As you can see from the pour, this beer has a very dark brown edge to it, whereas the head has a nice tan colour. However, at more of a distance it can certainly appear to be black because it is so dark. I am using the Kegland Stout Spout to pour this for a pleasing enough nitro substitute. At the point that you see this beer at now, it has been in the keg for just over three weeks, at an average of 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit, with a pressure setting of 12 psi. To obtain the best flavours and aromas from this beer, a drinking temperature range of between 10 to 13 degrees Celsius or 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit is recommended as a minimum. Those with less delicate taste palates may find a temperature as high as 16 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit is optimum. To enjoy this beer to its fullest with all its complexity, I suggest taking in its aroma first before sipping and sampling the flavours. Let's now move on to my tasting notes, starting with aroma. The aroma here is complex and is mostly shared between bourbon, chocolate, coffee and oak, along with roasted notes. This beer is very smooth with a moderately creamy entry with a nice extra texture to it, complex flavours that change as you make your way down the glass, that are made up of chocolate, coffee with bourbon and oak come in in the finish. You will also detect some very nice roastiness along the way too. In terms of notes, I have designed this beer to be very smooth and easy, but with complexity that makes it interesting as a treat kind of beer. The main areas that I have been tweaking during its evolution have been around BUGU ratio and the amount of bourbon. This final build design captures my vision for this beer very well, hence why this is now complete and I am now sharing it. Much of my final testing was made during the summer, and this beer worked very well then as an evening tipple. I believe that some will find this to be a very nice beer to brew for Christmas, not that it really needs much conditioning time if you use Quake. Certainly it tastes like a stout that is over 12% to myself and others that have sampled it, rather than the actual ABV that is involved here. The final overall impression of this beer is that it is a smooth tasty treat that keeps the drinker interested for longer than most stouts due to its design. Certainly I will be very interested to hear your feedback once you have brewed and then experienced this beer too. 
I do hope that you found this video useful, informative and interesting. If so, why not consider liking and subscribing? For further support you can join the channel's Facebook group, and if you would like to support the channel then check out the channel's merchandise store, as all profits go back into the channel. Until next time, happy brewing!